I think it would be good t- for folks to kind of um, understand, I guess, a bit of the landscape, the science in this area. And when I look at it anyway, and I look at v- lots of different studies, your studies and, and other folks' studies, it seems like in- that the researchers are, are, are interested in, in two main things when it comes to protein and muscle, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one is changes in, in what's called muscle protein synthesis um, or MPS, which I'll get you to, to help define and, and, and unpack. And then the other is changes in sort of hard outcomes, like the size of the muscle or the strength. Would that be a kind of fair summary of a lot of the research in this space? It's looking at these you know, biomarkers sure. of, of protein synthesis or changes in function? And muscle size. Sure. Right. Um, you know, and I, at some level we need to get, you know, lipid oxidation and cart and carb you know, and glucose oxidation into that package. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but yes, I agree. <laughs> okay. So if someone's hearing muscle protein synthesis, um, or MPS for the first time, or maybe they have seen someone on social media or, or have seen MPS on a study before. As I understand, just in terms of muscle physiology, there's a there's a, a bit of a, a sort of constant state of flux with with in muscle tissue. So there's synthesis of of new uh, contractile proteins, and then there's breakdown occurring at the same time. Can you kind of just explain the physiology here at whatever level you think is helpful for the listeners, um, and how how nutrition and and um, exercise sort of interact with this. Okay. Um, let me do some physiology first, and then you can ask mm-hmm. me the second questions again. Um, the first thing I think is important for everybody to understand is that whether you're 16 or 65, we all need to make almost 300 grams of new protein per day. Every protein in the body is doing what we call turnover. And different proteins have different lifespans. Uh, There are proteins in the liver that are replaced every hour. There are proteins in the muscle that are replaced every month and a half. And there's connective tissue like in your knee joints and whatever that are replaced every six months or so. But the, the striking thing people need to come to grips with is that about four times every year, you've replaced the equivalent of every protein in your body. So that's kind of interesting to keep in mind. Uh, If you're looking at maximum rate of growth, how much protein can you do with resistance exercise and lay down per day? That number is about five grams. And so you need to make 30 and only 15 and only five of it could actually be net gain. Okay, so that's turnover. If you look at the whole body, then about of that 300, about 25% is muscle. Muscle makes up 50% of your body protein, but only gets 25% of your turnover. Okay. Where the liver and the gut and the kidney have these get 75%. Mm-hmm. In the middle of the night, your liver has to be making protein or you die. Mm-hmm where your muscle becomes a reservoir of amino acid. It's kind of sitting there and it's not being used while you're sleeping. And so it actually donates the amino acids that the liver's using in the middle of the night. So you've got this balance thing going on where protein in the liver is constantly being made, where protein in the muscle is only getting made associated with meals. And so there's this constant going back and forth that you referred to between synthesis and breakdown. What's the net balance? Uh, During fasting period, muscle is in a net negative. And during feeding periods, it's in a net positive. Liver's not doing that. So that's kind of an overview of what is synthesis. Synthesis is that process of making those new proteins, whether they're enzymes or structural, whatever, those new proteins you make every day. And in the muscle, particularly as we get older, it's very much meal-driven. And we can get to distribution about that question later. Something else I want to ask you about measuring MPS and sort of looking at isolated 
proteins, whether you're comparing, say, whey versus egg versus soy or whatever it is. Um, and I appreciate getting down to this kind of um, very granular level has its role and is important in piecing this together. But how generalizable is that to how people actually eat in the real world in terms of having a, a sort of mixed meal with multiple foods after they do a workout, for example? Uh, I just did a seminar with a whey conference just here two days ago. And, the, you know, one of the things that is important to keep in mind is that uh, in whey protein, leucine's about 12%. And mm. in soy protein, it's a little less than 8%. So you can get to 2.5 grams with 23 grams of whey protein or 22, and it takes 32 with soy. Um, both will have the same effect if you give everybody 35 grams. <laughs> but if you only give 20 grams, whey will have an effect and soy won't. Right. Yeah. And that's, I guess, relevant if you're having a protein shake. But sure. if, you were having, exactly. if you're having a mixed meal, for example, and it had, exactly. I don't know, edamame or something and then some other foods in there and the leucine happened to be over 2.5 – if you're having a mixed meal with 45 grams of protein in it, and it's a, a combination of, of, of foods, um, it's not a problem. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're eating 120 grams of protein per day, it, the combination probably doesn't make much difference. If you're eating 50 grams, it probably does. So if we're thinking about the average general um, uh, adult out there who is just interested in healthy aging, they're not a bodybuilder. Um, is it 1.2 grams per kilogram? Is that where you're, you're sort of currently at in terms of that's the kind of lower threshold that you would want to meet on a daily basis on average? So if, yeah. So if I was having a healthy 55 year old, who's pretty physically active, you know, doing some resistance, doing some aerobic training, I usually target the range of 1.2 to 1.6 and they can kind of fall in there wherever they want, um, you know, whatever meal pattern they want. But, um, you know, can we measure the difference between one, you know, using protein synthesis, using the tools that we have, can we measure the difference between 1.2 and 1.6? The answer is no. Is, is this protein intake? of, you, know, you said in your studies 1.5, but you recommend that sort of 1.2 to 1.6 as being a more optimal intake. Is that the same for men and women? Is there any evidence to suggest that protein intake would differ between gender? Not, it doesn't seem to. Um, both in the young studies or in the elderly studies, they seem to translate pretty well. So I think, I think you know, the lean body mass is sort of, Ultimately, you'd like to have the protein relative to lean body mass, but we typically don't know that. So it's per body composition. Um, women typically at the same weight would have a little less lean mass. So mm -hmm. potentially they can have a little lower um, uh, amount. Uh, we did a lot of weight loss studies with women, uh, and we found that there was a real hard line at around one gram per kg. Uh, if they got below that, we pretty much lost all the beneficial effects of protein or exercise or whatever. Um, mm. They just changed their body composition. They might lose weight, but they had the same body fat percentage when they after they got done. Mm. 